recording now. And yep, don't forget, if you can avoid putting yourselves on mute, please don't mute yourselves. I can, I'm obviously going to be here and I can take you off if I need to, but there might be a bit of a lag. Okay. All right, letting everybody in now. Oh, my dog's lying on. Go crazy. Ah, lovely. Look at all those fresh morning faces. Oh, <laughs> lots of people. <laughs> How lovely to see everybody. Just waiting for a couple of people to get oh, in. Hi, and hi. in. There's even some cats joining us. <laughs> <laughs> And Sharon's at Brighton. By is Sharon in Brighton? Is she? It looks like she's <laughs> zooming in somewhere a bit more exotic. No. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. So we might get started this morning, and I'll admit anybody who's still in the waiting room in a moment. So good morning, everybody. It's so lovely to see you all. And thank you for joining us for this morning's launch of Avid Reader's Spring Reading Guide. I'd just like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I am broadcasting to you from, the Yagara and Turrbal people. I pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, so before we begin, I'd just like to quickly reiterate uh, some of the information that I sent in the email that you received with the link to join this morning. So you've all automatically been placed on mute, but if there's time at the end of the event, then we will be going to questions um, and I can read them out if you send them to me um, using the chat box. So if you can't see that, then you can find the button that will open it towards the bottom left of your screen. Um, the questions will come straight through to me and as I said, I'll read them out along with your name um, when I'm prompted to do so. Um, if you're taking any notes today or photos, then we'd absolutely love to um, see them, please share them on social media and tag us. On Twitter, we are at avidreader4101. I'd also like to mention that we have a special promotion on at the moment. Um, if you use the code EVENT at checkout when you're making a purchase on our website, then you'll receive 10% off your order. Um, if you're making your purchases in store, then you can still get that discount, don't worry. Just mention at the counter that you've attended our spring reading guide launch today and um, one of our staff members will apply that discount to your purchase. And so I'd now like to hand you over to Avid's super reading team who will be um, sharing their favorite books with you today. We have Fiona Steger, buyer Sarah Deasy and book club manager Jennifer Stevens. So Sarah, um, I'd love you to take it from here. Hi everyone, um, my name's Sarah and I'm a buyer at Avid Reader. Uh, this year has definitely been a strange one and uh, it does seem like all of us are a bit on the back foot just trying to keep up with everything. Uh, so we really appreciate everyone logging in and listening to us this morning. Um, all the new books that have been delayed since March are finally starting to get published now. Uh, so the next couple of months are going to be crazy and overwhelming but a brilliant time for new titles. Uh, firstly is a book that I've been waiting for about 10 years for, uh, ever since I read Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. Uh, it's the long awaited second novel from Susanna Clark called Piranesi, and it's getting published on Monday. And uh, funnily enough, it's a story about a man in isolation. Uh, Piranesi lives in a mansion, which is more of a labyrinth with an infinite number of halls and antechambers, each filled with giant statues of people and animals, uh, that work as landmarks for Piranesi to find his way around. He has lived there for as long as he can remember, uh, all alone except for some bones that he's found and tenderly cares for, and one living mystery man who occasionally meets to discuss the search for knowledge with the capital K. Uh, just to say more about what would happen next would be a big disservice to the novel. Uh, not because there's a mystery in it, but the whole book itself is a mystery right from the start. Uh, where is he? Who is he? Why is he? Uh, Piranesi is a wholly innocent and curious narrator, guiding us through his world and his place in it. Um, life is hard for him. He is alone with very few resources to take care of himself other than the fish he can catch and the seaweed he dries so that he can make a fire. Uh, but he feels absolutely blessed to receive every experience that the house can give him. 
Uh, the brilliance of Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell was Clark's world building, uh, where every exquisite mundane detail had been thought out and footnoted. Uh, I don't know if anyone has um, read that book before, but just it's full of these wonderful footnotes uh, that just makes it feel so real. Uh, Pyrenees is the same, but distilled into more of an um, essence. Uh, it's wholly original and clever. And it's a visual spectacle to lose yourself in. And um, Guillermo del Toro needs to make this into a movie right now. <laughs> um, next, I wanted to talk about another highly anticipated book, uh, which was Utopia Avenue by David Mitchell. It's London in 1967. And Dean Moss is a musician on the brink of destitution. He has just been mugged and lost his rent money. His landlord kicks him out and he loses his job at the cafe when he dares to ask his boss for an advance. Uh, he's lost everything, but then it all changes when he's approached by Levin, a wannabe music manager who is trying to build the greatest band in England. Levin brings Dean together with folk singer and pianist Elf Holloway, um, who herself has had some success in the folk coffee houses, but is recovering from a relationship breakup. Jasper Dezout, who is a master of the lead guitar, but he struggles with demons in his head. And Griff, who's a no-nonsense, no um, always up for a bar fight drummer. The next 600 pages, it is a brick of a book, uh, uh, follows the brand, band's struggle uh, and meteoric rise and eventual downfall over the course of the following year. Like every great brand, band, each member gets a chance to shine while adding to the whole of the group. And it gives you the space to become invested in their success and the heartbreak of their drug addled missteps. Dean and Elf and Jasper and Griff are wholly compute, complete humans. Uh, along the way, you meet familiar faces like David Bowie and Sid Barrett, Janis Joplin. Uh, but what I loved was how Visceral Mitchell wrote about music. It's a difficult thing to do. And not only did I believe the musicians wrote all the music in this book, but I could almost hear it. And I want the vinyl to go on my vinyl shelf. <laughs> Um, of course, this is David Mitchell, and if you haven't read some of his earlier works, including The Bone Clocks or The Thousand Autumns of Dave Jacob Zoot, um, yes, it is the same de Zoot as our guitarist Jasper, uh, there is a section towards the end of the novel when Jasper's inner demons become more than just a voice in his head, and the tone shifts uh, and verges almost into the fantastical. Uh, it's probably helpful to know that these novels all tie together. So if you haven't read any of the earlier works, um, go read them next. Uh, now on to a couple of debuts. Uh, the first is The Morbids by Ewa Ramsey, where um, Caitlin is obsessed with her own death. A couple of years ago, there was an accident. And ever since, Caitlin knows her time is up, her luck has run out. And any day now, she's going to die, probably by being grabbed by one evening uh, with an unknown attacker while walking through one of Sydney's darkly lit parks. She has joined a support group to, of like-minded people nicknamed the Morbids, and they each have their own demise predetermined in their heads. Uh, for some, you know, it has to be cancer and they can't understand why the doctors can't find anything. Uh, for others, it might be a train crash and they dread the knowledge that they can't avoid public transport forever. Uh, this support group doesn't really seem to help uh, the ever rotating counsellors uh, have given pretty much given up on them. And rather than supporting each other to get over their phobias, they entrench themselves in with their mutual sympathy. Uh, Caitlin herself, our narrator, uh, she's floundering. Uh, she's in her early 20s and her parents can't understand why she gave up her perfectly respectable career in demographics to become, you know, just a waitress. Why she lives in a shitty apartment that smells like cat pee and why she won't plan for her future. Uh, the best friend uh, who Caitlin has been ignoring is getting married in Bali uh, in six months time. And she tries to push Caitlin to come to dress fittings and be more involved, to be more present in, in life. Uh, but then uh, Caitlin starts talking to a handsome doctor who frequents her restaurant. Uh, but she, you know, she can't even do a serious relationship because that requires being vulnerable and honest. Uh, so The Morbid is a book about mental illness, but it's very tender and nuanced. Uh, you don't even really realise that Caitlin's having a breakdown until it's too late. Uh, and then, you know, you go through her slow recovery, and, but it's written very delicately and with wonderful love and patience. It's about friendships and unconditional love, um, about knowing the very core of another person, 
it's morbid, but it's also funny and very hopeful. Uh, another morbid debut, uh, I've read uh, State Highway 1 by Sam Coley. Sam is a New Zealander and the novel won the 2017 Ritual Prize for Emerging Authors. Uh, and it's a very accomplished debut. Alex, um, the main character, packed up and left Auckland as soon as he left school. The last few years, he has been living in Dubai, working in music publishing. But after some devastating news about his parents, he returns home for their funeral. He travels with his twin sister to the very northern tip of New Zealand, uh, where they can say goodbye to the spirits of his parents as they walk across the ocean. Uh, but they can't bear to return to their childhood home. And Amy, the twin sister, makes Alex promise that they will continue driving south following the New Zealand State Highway 1 all the way to the bottom of the country. Uh, throughout this road trip, Alex reconnects with the troubled past of his family and the country that he'd abandoned. It's um, really wonderful to read this book with an atlas next to you and a map of New Zealand following the highway down as they travel. Of course, being stuck in a car for several weeks with your twin sister uh, would make any wounds start to reopen. And the novel likes to sit uncomfortably on this tension, flicking back and forward in time from Alex's childhood and the difficult relationship he had with his family to his time in Dubai where he was trying to remake himself. But opening all these wounds is necessary to heal, uh, to break through the grief and come out of it on the other side. It's deeply affecting and moving and the journey just feels so personal and compelling and it's a wonderful debut by Sam Coley. Uh, finally, I wanted to briefly talk about The Mother Fault by Kate, Kate Mildenpore. Uh, this is her second novel after 2016 Skylarking, and it's actually Avid Reader's Book of the Month, but um, September. Jan has also read this one as well, so we might have a little bit of discussion about it afterwards. Uh, but it's set in a near future Australia. Um, the government has kind of been taken over by the department uh, who runs everything in almost a kind of 1984 style, uh, yeah, um, control. Um, everyone has trackers in their hands that can get scanned and um, the government or the department pretty much knows where everyone is at one time. Uh, Mim, who is our main character, she lives uh, quite comfortably at home with her two young children. Her husband, Ben, is an engineer who works offshore on um, a mining rig off the coast of Indonesia. But then she gets the news that uh, her husband has disappeared. And she has to make the, the difficult decision of waiting and trusting that the government is gonna do the right thing and find her husband and bring everything back to normal. Or if she has to take this into her own hands uh, which she does eventually do. She runs away with her children. Uh, they cut their trackers out and try and track down her husband who she believes is in danger. Um, so this involves a very you know, dangerous journey uh, across Australia, up to Darwin, and then onto a boat to travel to Indonesia. Um, it's a wonderful thriller um, and Mostly what I loved about it was the, the closeness of this dystopian world that Kate has built for Australia. Um, it could happen, like everything in there almost is happening right now. It's just that one step further. Um, and yeah, it was a really fantastic book by Kate. Yeah, I really enjoyed it too. It was one of those books I just laid on the couch on a Sunday afternoon and pretty much inhaled. And um, Sarah, um, what I liked about it was the how Kate has crafted the near future. So mm. it's kind of slightly this utopian, but it's so believable. Did you yeah, think it that has she that, did that feel of 1984, but it's just so realistic? It's not this far off, crazy in the future thing. It's yeah, every everything could be happening right now, and with um, you know uh, even just social media tracking you and like the data hoarding of companies at the moment, you kind of feel that this isn't that far off. It's all, it's so subtle. The changes mm -hmm. in society are so subtle. And the other thing I wanted to ask you about is, is um, what you thought of how Kate has crafted the emotional life of Mim? You know, that in terms of 
she's a mother, but she's a bit frustrated with being a mother. She's had to give up her yeah, career. Absolutely. Yeah, well, what remember just you? before that she had a um, she had a career. She was a geologist, was it? Um, and so this is almost a chance for her to kind of reclaim back her control of her life. She had a, a promise with her husband Ben of this was what you were going to do, you were going to provide for the family and this is what I was going to do, keeping the family safe at home. And then that was broken. And um, it's it's kind of, yeah, Mim's re reclaiming her life and making a decision. Uh, she doesn't always make the right decisions, um, but it's her taking control back of her life and, and making things happen. Yeah, I think the, the novel works on so many levels, but it is a cautionary tale um, if you're thinking of going sailing in the near future, do not read this book before you go sailing. <laughs> it's horrifying. It's so scary. I do know I never want to go sailing. I never wanted to, but I certainly don't after reading. It. No, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a long, harrowing journey, and not being with only one person on the ship who basically knows what they're doing, it gives you big respect for people who can go out and have that knowledge, and you know. Be so self-reliant yep. on when there's nothing around. You just there's just water everywhere. Yep. <laughs> yep. Thank you, Sarah. That was wonderful. And I think we're going to Jennifer now. Thanks, Fiona, and thanks, Sarah. So many, so many more books, wonderful books to read. Um, I wanted to start by talking about um, the Labyrinth by Amanda Laurie. Um, Amanda Laurie. Uh, is an Australian fiction and non-fiction writer um, and I was, was really, really delighted to, to, to read this, this one with, um, with our Australian book club. Um, this, this is a story about Erica. Uh, Erica's, the setup is that Erica's son Daniel has, has he's an artist and he's committed a crime. And Erica um, makes the decision to leave her life behind. She sells up everything, leaves her life, and buys a shack by the seaside. And uh, this, this shack is near enough to where her son is imprisoned that she will be able to visit him uh, if she's allowed to visit once a fortnight. So that's, that's how the novel begins. But it also is about how Erica is, is in a sense going back to her beginnings. Um, the very beginning of the, of, the, of the novel starts with the words, let me begin in my father's house. I grew up in an asylum, a manicured madhouse. And, and that's an example, I guess, of, of Laurie's prose. It's so beautiful that someone can get manicured and madhouse into one sentence. It's, it's just gorgeously written. Um, and Erica's father, had been a psychiatrist. So, um, and he very much believed in the Jungian approach that um, a cure, the cure for many ills is to build something or to make something. So um, the use of the hands he saw as a, as a powerful med medicine. So in her shack by the sea, Erica begins a process of building a labyrinth. And there had been a labyrinth at the asylum where she grew up, so she'd been introduced to that as a child. Um, but uh, she, she starts, she wants to build something much more organic than the one of her childhood. And she went into some, quite a bit of depth of describing labyrinths and, and what makes a labyrinth different to a maze. And uh, I did a little for you. So unlike a maze, with mostly blind alleys designed for entrapment, a labyrinth can be laid out by anyone. The maze is a challenge to the brain. How smart are you? The labyrinth to the heart. Will you surrender? In the maze, you grapple with the challenge, but in the labyrinth, you let go. Effortlessly, you come back to where you started, somehow changed by the act of surrender. In this way, the labyrinth is said to be a model of reversible destiny. So, I mean, this is a novel with many, many big themes. There's, there's, there's motherhood and guilt and who's responsible for, for our acts. There's 
art as, as a restorative. Um, there's, there's just so much in this beautiful novel. And it's one that uh, when I discussed it at, with Book Club, uh, it, it came out from basically everyone that, like a labyrinth, they actually wanted to walk this path again. They, they felt they wanted to read the novel again and experience it again because it's just such a beautiful um, exploration and it has this path into its centre and then it has another path out. And uh, it, the novel itself is actually like a labyrinth. So I, I think it's a really, really wonderful one for book clubs, but uh, also one to just read and enjoy yourself. Um, the next book I wanted to talk to you about is um, What Are You Going Through by Sigrid Nunes. Uh, so Sigrid Nunes has been writing for a long time, but it, it might be more um, that with her novel the, F the Friend, you might have become aware of her. She sort of had a, her audience has widened a lot by that novel because it won the National Book Award. Um, what Are You Going Through has a similar tone and feel to The Friend. Um, there's a, a narrator, she, the narrator has this, this intimate conversational tone. And this is a story that it's, it's, about, it's about friendship and it's also about dying. Um, in this, uh, there are two, two women uh, and our unnamed narrator has been asked by her friend who has cancer to, to be there with her uh, when she makes uh, the, the decision to end her life. Uh, so she's, it's not, she's not been asked to participate, but just to be there. And so the novel unfolds with our narrator observing, observing the life around her and she, she starts off with, with big stories. She'll talk about going to a lecture and the, and, the, and the big ideas that are raised by the lecture. But then it's only at the end you learn that the, the person giving the lecture is her ex. So she, brings, she, she gives you the large story and then brings it back to the intimate. And she does this over and over again in, in the stories she introduces of different people she meets. Uh, so it's... it's um, it's it's a lovely um, it's a it's a lovely quiet novel. This one, uh, there are, are unusual scenes. There's there's a, there's in fact a talking cat in this book, uh, which can can be believed to have been just a dream, or you can think about it differently. The cat is almost like a Scheherazade, who who tells stories uh, to to the narrator uh, when she's staying in an Airbnb. But I guess the the thing that that grows most in this novel is, is a sense of intimacy uh, between the two women of the story. And there's some lovely, lovely lines, which I'd like to read to you, where the narrator and her friend uh, describe uh, watching a, a film together, make way for tomorrow. And in this film, an elderly couple are forced to separate when they lose their house and none of their five children will take both parents in. And she says, we watched it sitting side by side on the sofa, choking and clutching at each other like two people hopelessly trying to save each other from drowning, which is not to say that we regretted having watched it. No matter how sad, a beautifully told story lifts you up. And that, is very much the key to this novel. It is beautifully told. And even though it is sad, it does have that, that wonderful capacity alongside the sadness to lift you. Uh, so that was that, the um, Sigrid Nunes. Uh, next, I wanted to talk to you about Kate Grenville's wonderful new novel, uh, A Room Made of Leaves. Um, I was, I was really lucky. I had the opportunity to have a chat with Kate Grenville. She came into Avid one day just as a, as a customer. Uh, she was uh, browsing a couple of years ago and I asked her about what she was working on and she, she told me she was writing this fictional memoir of Elizabeth MacArthur. And at the time I thought how interesting that was because the, her um, book that I had recently read was her own memoir of her mother. So she'd written a, a non-fiction memoir 
of her mother and now she was writing a, a fictional memoir of a figure from history. And uh, when we, uh, earlier this year, there was a, a booksellers launch of Kate Grenville's book and I asked her uh, how she'd found the transition from, she'd, she'd written a couple of non-fiction books in a row and now she was, had written this, this fiction and uh, she said that she found it absolutely freeing and she loved the freedom in this, that she had in this book to make things up. Uh, and that's, that's the sense that you get in this, in this novel as a reader. You sense that as a writer, uh, Grenville's delighting in creating Elizabeth MacArthur's inner life and providing her with a bright intelligence and even some pleasure uh, in her reimagined world for her. So the way the novel begins is with Kate Grenville setting up the scenario whereby Elizabeth MacArthur's long hidden memoirs have been discovered. And she says, in these private papers written near the end of her life, she steps out from behind the bland documents that were her public face. There are a series of hot outpourings, palettes of memory lit by passionate feeling. With sometimes shocking frankness, they invite us to see right into her heart. So she's created this wonderful scenario where uh, she is merely the editor of this, of this novel, of these fictional memoirs, and uh, is telling us that these are, in fact, tongue in cheek, in fact, uh, Elizabeth MacArthur's uh, memoirs. And, and it's, it's, it's wonderful. You've also enjoyed it, didn't you, Fiona? Yes, I thought it was great. And once again, like Kate Mildenfall's um, book, um, this Kate, wonderful Kate's out there writing, this Kate Granville, she has really crafted that wonderful internal life of Elizabeth MacArthur. You can see her desires, her frustrations, having to live with this bullying husband. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I thought she did all of that so well. There was that authentic heart to Elizabeth MacArthur and there was an authentic heart to, to Kate's book too, I thought. Mm. Yeah, how, no, I agree. How do you think she balanced fiction and fact? How do you think she, were you convinced by that? I loved it. I, I, I mean, I, and I loved the fact that she was, she was playing with the form and, you know, she's obviously researched meticulously, but she also gives us the reasons for Elizabeth MacArthur to have been differently represented in the past. She thinks about things like how in Elizabeth's letters, Elizabeth would always have been self-censoring, always thinking who is going to be reading this. Her husband read her letters. She sent her letters to uh, the family in England who she used to live with. So these letters would be read out in the parlor to everybody. So she had to think about everything. And there were some, she'd try and get little subtle messages through in these letters that, uh, that said a little bit more than you could say to, to a, um, the, um, you know, the, the pastor <laughs> at, at, at the church. You know, she, she really, um, Kate Grenville gives all these reasons for why Elizabeth was presented differently to how she is able to reimagine her. And I think she, she, she makes that um, also very justifiable and, and uh, she creates such a, uh, an interesting internal life, as you said. Um, I, um, and I think she, um, she, she I, ha I do have to read one other little part because I, I just loved it so much where she says to you as a reader, and if I may tease you, my unknown reader, let me remind you that you only have my word for any of this. This story, and she's talking about a relationship between Elizabeth MacArthur and, um, and the Astronomer Royal. Uh, this story of the tangling of two hearts in Sydney in 1791 is recorded nowhere but on the document you are reading. It may appear to speak with authority, but might it be nothing more than the mischief of an invent, uh, the mischievous invention of a sly old woman? So she's even inserting herself in there and it's, it's just beautifully done, that, that balancing act, I think. 
So yeah, I highly recommend it. Um, the next one I wanted to talk about is one that I know Fiona's all, also absolutely loved. I love this book. Um, it's, um, it's one that absolutely just gets you uh, right in your core. It's, um, so Andrew O'Hagan's Mayflies. Uh, I, I fell in love with Andrew O'Hagan's writing with his, his last novel, um, The Illuminations. Uh, and uh, so I was, couldn't wait to get my hands on his new one. Um, it's, to say it's a book about friendship is, is just not enough. Um, friendship hardly seems... Uh, big enough a word to describe the the um, the relationships in this in this book. It's a novel in two parts. The first occurs in the summer of 1986, uh, and the second 30 years later, in the autumn of 2017. Um, there are two main characters: um, Polly Dawson and, and Jimmy, and Jimmy's telling the story. Uh, and Tully is. Tully Dawson is, um, he's someone who everybody, everybody likes. He, at that time, he had the kind of looks that appealed to all sexes and all ages, and his natural effrontery opened people up. He had innate charisma, a brilliant record collection, complete fearlessness in political argument, and he knew how to love you more than anybody else. Other guys were funny and brilliant and better at this and that. But Tully loved you. So that's sort of setting up who Tully is and the relationship that Tully and Jimmy share. But uh, the first part of the book is revolves all about a, a trip to Manchester. And there's a group of them, about six, and they all, they talk to each other in, in, in movie quotes. They, they all share the same love of, of punk rock they they um they make mixtapes for each other. They um you know they're just in this this wonderful period of their lives when um when music is really all that matters and uh and their and their friendships are just so intense. Um they're 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 really they 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 have this extraordinary weekend which they don't ever want to have end. It's sort of a it goes on and on the festival uh, of, of music that they, that they attend in Manchester. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it sits alongside the second half of the book as I guess this is the time in the sun, the, the first part. And then uh, in the second part of the book, it's 30 years later and, and Tully has, um, let's rings, rings, uh, rings Jimmy to tell him that he has cancer. And so the second half of the book is then is then that story um, of of how they how they handle that. But um, it's we had we had such a fantastic event the other night, didn't we? It was um, with with Andrew O'Hagan and Robert Forster from the Go Betweens. Uh, and, and and the reason uh, we asked Robert Forster to do the interview, so he's. Uh, a fine musician from the go-betweens is because the go-betweens pop up in 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 the mayflies and um, the character. I think there's a poster on the on the wall in one of the share one of the houses. And then during the interview with Andrew and Robert, Andrew talks very um, fondly about hearing the go-betweens play at a particular venue. He could remember the day and the time when he'd heard them play. So you could see that Andrew O'Hagan, he was a bit kind of besotted with the fact that uh, he had Robert Forster doing the interview with him. And Robert did a great job of asking really interesting questions. So that will go up on our YouTube and I really recommend um, people listening to that, especially because you get to hear Andrew O'Hagan read from Mayflies in that wonderful Scottish accent of his. And who doesn't love a man with a good Scottish accent? Yeah. Absolutely. I wish I could. I wish I could do one. And he did read from one of my favourite parts of the novel, where they're at the festival, and he says, "You know, our hair was soaking wet. The Ayrshire boys appeared from all corners of the hall, and we hugged, and the music soared, and it seemed like a huge animation of the things that mattered to us then: Tibbs and Hogg, Limbo and Tully and Clogs, the full brass of being." 
And then he said, they say you know nothing at 18, but there are things you know at 18 that you will never know again. Um, and it's, it's just such a joyful, joyful experience reading this novel. And I loved it so much. So really recommend it. Um, did yeah, you I really loved it? I, la I laughed through the first section. Some of it is just so funny and then quietly <laughs> sobs through the second section. <laughs> But it's a real celebration of men's friendship and we often don't have good novels about the, the beauty and the deep love between all of these men that, that's, that goes on for decades, really, even if they don't see each other all the time. And um, it's a real celebration of, of friendship. It's also very much a novel about class. You know, these were working class guys in um, Thatcherite, post-Thatcherite times. So he captures what their lives were like. They, they were going to have lives very different to their fathers. And the whole role of fatherhood, I think, was also an interesting exploration mm. in this book. So great book, really good book. Mm. Yeah, agreed. Thank you. Um, now, my book club um, said to me they wanted to, read, they wanted to read something that enabled them to escape. Uh, in these times, they've been feeling that we've been reading some really fabulous things, but they wanted something a bit more escapist. So we decided we'd read uh, The Midnight Library by Matt Haig. And uh, this was really quite delightful. It is a fabulous escape. Um, it's a novel about uh, Nora Seed. And Nora has, um, she believes... She's living a, a life full of regrets. She believes she's living the wrong life. She made the decision to, to move back home after she finished university, studying philosophy. She moved back home and then her mother got ill. And so she, she looked after her mother when she was dying and then stayed uh, working in a music shop. And a dozen years later, she's still there. And so she's, she's, she's feeling weighed down by this all of this... Um, this regret, thinking about the different lives that she might have lived if she'd made different choices. And I won't go into how, but she ends up in this place, the Midnight Library. And it is a place between life and death. And her old school librarian is there. And she basically directs her to the books in the library and says, well, look, each one of these books uh, contains a life that you that you might have led, and so through this this um, this mechanism, Nora is able to live the lives that she that she wished she might have led. So she is able to experience what it's like to be an Olympic swimmer. If she hadn't given up swimming, she gets to experience. Uh, she she get, takes that book and she gets to taste that life. Uh, she, she gets to experience what it feels like to be in that kind of body of an Olympic swimmer. She, um, she also uh, goes and experiences the life of what, what would happen if she hadn't jilted her fiancé Dan at the altar. And so she experiences what that, that life married to Dan would have been like. She, she tries out her life as a glaciologist if she'd in fact you know, followed that path. So it's all about us, you know, we, so many of us, I think, get caught up in thinking, oh, what if I'd done that? How different would my life have been? So it gives you that opportunity to, to, to explore from, through Nora all these different, different lives. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's quite joyous. And it's, um, it's, it's because Nora had studied philosophy and, and that's her lived life. She takes her, her understanding of philosophy with her in all of these experiences that she has. So there's lots of philosophical questioning. Uh, it's, it's very much uh, an uplifting novel and it's all about embracing, leaving regret aside and embracing, embracing the life we're living. Uh, and it's, it's yeah, lots of fun. Um, I also wanted to briefly mention um, Laura Elvery's wonderful collection of short stories, Ordinary Matter. Um, I haven't read all of them yet, but I, I'm really enjoying these stories. They are all, there are 20 stories in the book, and they're uh, all inspired by the 20 times 
women have won uh, the Nobel Prize for Science. So there are, um, there are actually 19 women because Marie Curie won twice. Uh, and each story, it's, it's really interesting. They're not, they're not stories about the women. They're not, they're not biographies. They're not um, in any sense traditional. Uh, they're quite um, experimental. Um, Laura takes inspiration from, from the scientists' lives. And it might just be something about... Um, the way Marie Curie's husband died, for example, and that's something that comes into one of the one of the stories. So uh, Marie Curie is not actually a um, character in that story, but some of the things, uh, the ideas of her of that won her the prize, and then also some other little facts about her life come into the story. So it's they're very cleverly woven, and. One of the things I really enjoy with each story, uh, when I finish each story at the back of the book, there are author's notes. And in those notes, Laura has um, written a, a short um, description of, of, that, um, of that scientist, but also just highlighting some of those things that might have been her inspiration. So it gives you a way of thinking about each story and, and sort of elaborates and and helps you to understand and think about what you've read in, in, a, in, in the ways that Laura might have been thinking about it when she wrote the book, wrote the, the short story. Um, and, and you've read, read, read this one as well, Fiona. Yes, yes, yes. And it's truly imaginative. That's what I liked about mm. it. I've read a lot of short stories that are very, um, more like auto fiction or self-reflective of the, of the author's experiences. And that's, that's lovely as well, but Laura is truly imaginative and you can really see the writer's craft at work here. Yeah, I thought, I was surprised and I, I love them. I thought they're brilliant. Mm -hmm. And also, I think they'll be really good for any teachers out there, anybody um, doing English extension for years 11 and 12. I think they're really, a really, there's so much in there to talk about. I think they'll be great to study. Yeah, I'd agree, yeah. So that, but that's it from me. <laughs> well, that's great. Oh, the pair of you, I've got, my piles have gotten bigger and bigger as well. <laughs> uh, I've had a great reading year um, so far. There's been some wonderful books out there. Thank you all so much for joining us and listening to us. It seems quite like quite a old fashioned thing to do to sit around um, and listen to people talk about books. But the fact that we can use 21st cent century um, to be um, all around Australia and in fact all around the world. So a special shout out to Sharon Bernhardt who's actually in LA, California. If you're on Gallery View you can see her and that's the view of the beach that she's moved to. And she's still a proud member of the Oxley Sterling Book Club um, out of South Bank. So she was here for a year uh, and has moved back to LA. So welcome Sharon. If you've seen Sharon taking a sip of wine, it's because it's five o'clock in LA. She hasn't taken up day drinking. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but um, <laughs> it's so lovely to see so many of you here. Um, so straight on to my books. Um, I have loved The Pull of the Stars by Emma Donoghue. And um, Sarah mentioned the fact that a lot of books have been pushed back because of COVID. Um, they, in fact, bought, um, brought Emma Donoghue's book publication forward. And that's because it's set in 1918 um, in the middle of the Spanish flu epidemic. And it is so relevant to today in, in um, a, once again, a very prescient way. So it's the story of Julia Power. She is a midwife. She's a nurse at a hospital in Dublin. And, and she has a special ward that she's um, in control of, and that is pregnant women who have, have the flu. So um, she's dealing with them as patients. She's also dealing with um, the ramifications of First World War, where her, her brother um, has come back to the war, from war and he's mute. So it's her, it's just a couple of days in her life in this small ward. Um, if you know Emma Donoghue's work, you might remember her from The Room, which is also, uh, once again, a story of a woman who's confined in a room. She also wrote The Wonder, 
um, which I um, loved um, as much as this one. And that's the story of a young girl who, um, it's set in Ireland, in country Ireland, in the late 1800s, early 1900s from memory. And it's about a girl who her family are convinced, um, has, has the stigmata and are convinced that she is going to be a saint. So what Emma does well is um, the lives of women. She also does particularly well putting all of the story into one small room, the confines of what that means. Um, so Julia Power, Power is a wonderful character. Um, so she's dealing with these women who are in various stages of the, F, of, um, the flu and in various stages of pregnancy. So I do caution that if anybody is pregnant, do not read this story. It is um, very, um, very confronting uh, about the birth process and what these women were going through and what was standard um, medical practice in, in um, Ireland at the time. Um, um, the other thing that's really interesting, of course, is the fact that this is a city that is dealing with um, the Spanish flu and millions of people around the world will die of it. And of course, Dublin is very a very poor um, city and you've got people who are absolutely, they're just falling in the street dead. Um, so they've got people carrying, going around picking up the carcasses. And there's also signs up around every, everywhere trying to get people to um, do things like wash their hands uh, wear masks. So they're the things that make it so relevant to, to today. And um, throughout it, there um, are signs up around the city. And there's one that this is, this is the advice um, the government is giving to people in Dublin. Purge the bowels regularly. Conserve manpower. To keep in fighting trim, infection culls only the weakest of the herd. Eat an onion a day to keep illness at bay. So it's this interesting mix of, of, um, of science and, uh, and history of the time. So I loved it. Um, I thought it was a very powerful story. Uh, another one that I have loved is The Lying Life of um, Adults by Elena Parente. People will know her from her wonderful series. Um, and they um, publishers or someone coined the term Parente Fever where people were just so um, in love and obsessed with her, her books that um, it, was, it was published here in um, Australia in four volumes. People would finish the second volume and then rushed in wanting desperately for the third and then the fourth ser series of her books. So this is um, a standalone story. Um, it, once again, we return to Naples where her books are set. Once again, there's an unknown narrator and, and we start through um, the eyes of a young adolescent. And that's what Elena Parente does so well. She really gets into the minds of um, adolescent girls. And it's the story of a girl, uh, Giovanna. Um, she's a loved only child of intellectual parents. So slightly different to the previous books that Elena has written. Um, and Giovanna overhears a conversation where her father, who loves her greatly, um, says quietly to her mother, um, Giovanna's becoming um, quite ugly, isn't she? She looks like my aunt, uh, my sister Vittora. And um, Giovanna overhears that. It um, emotionally destroys her. Then she goes in search of this aunt Vittora. Her father is estranged from, her, from his family. And um, part of the story is, is Giovanna um, finding out how and why and meeting the Torah and um, it, it goes from there. It's, it's wonderful. It once again captures Naples. It seems to be set more in the, in the 80s or the 90s as opposed to the other series. But uh, what I did was because there's a list of streets that Giovanna has to follow to, to get to her aunt's place. So I went onto Google Maps and I followed the trail through the streets of Naples. So it, it's wonderful. I really liked it. Also, um, it's a testament to the power of Anne Goldstein, who is Elena's um, translator, because any, any work in translation owes such a great debt to the translator. Um, and if you're at all interested, 
uh, Europa Editions, the very fine publishers of Elena Ferrante's books, they've been hosting lots of um, online um, Zoom meetings with Anne Goldstein, where you can go and, and hear her speak. So I, I really recommend that she speaks very powerfully about the role of a translator and what, it's, what it means to have to translate someone's work. Um, we're so, millions of people around the world uh, are vested in, in um, Elena Ferrante's work. So yeah, I highly, highly recommend that one. Uh, a little bit of non-fiction. I read and loved The Golden Maid by Richard Feidler. We all know and love him from Conversations. And I had the great pleasure of interviewing Richard for an event around this book. So it's The Golden Maze. It's a biography of Prague. Uh, and he starts at um, a prehistory and takes us through um, the story of Prague, um, the history, the politics, and particularly the personalities, historical figures that have created this amazing city. He also talks about um, how he fell in love with Prague, his first um, time there, and then the times that he's gone back and the people that he's met. Um, Richard is a great conversationalist and a great interviewer, and it's like he has interviewed the historical people of the time. And I asked him in the interview that I did with him, uh, how does he do that? How does he write a book that makes you feel like you're listening to um, conversations that he's having with his people. And he said, he's very mindful of that. It's a particular uh, thing that he does. And how he does it, he reads it aloud. So he reads it aloud to his family members. So the whole book um, is read aloud. So you feel like uh, Richard is talking to you and uh, it's um, an absorbing city. I've never been to, to Prague. I was in Europe in about 89, 90 and my father begged me um, to not to go to Prague because of the unrest and because I was a young woman traveling by myself. He also begged me not to go to Naples as well, which is rather ironic because they're two of the cities that I have fallen in love with through the writings of um, these two very fine authors. But I highly recommend that to anybody who, who um, wants a good, good history that really allows you into the story. So it's wonderful. I love it so much. Um, on the cover of our spring reading guide, which people have either a physical copy of or I sent you a PDF of it, um, there's this wonderful artwork by uh, Indigenous artist which, uh, Rachel Sara. And there's a book that she has illustrated called Titters, but she's also done the artwork to this wonderful jigsaw puzzle. Now, when COVID hit, we could not keep up with the demand of jigsaws. It, I think it was one of those things that um, it was a mindful activity that took people away from, from the media and from scrolling endlessly through depressing um, you know, social media feeds. So people fell in love with jigsaws and this is one that I think will be a beautiful gift as well as for you to do yourself. It's called Diverse Women and it features um, Rachel's beautiful artwork. And that is a segue for me to speak about the last book that I will talk about, which is um, Family by Auntie Faye Muir and Sue Lawson. They've done the words for it. And that's been beautifully illustrated by Jasmine Seymour. Um, Jasmine Seymour um, is an incredibly talented um, Indigenous uh, illustrator. She did a beautiful book called um, Baby Business, which has been a beloved book um, at Where the Wild Things Are. And this book, I think, will also go into our canon of wonderful um, children's books. Um, I'm doing lots of um, book fairs at the moment. I'm doing lots of book chats to to parents and to teachers and teach librarians. And I've been talking to them about the importance of diversity um, in their library collections, but also in, in family libraries as well. Um, and certainly since um, Black Lives Matter, we've been inundated with um, schools and families wanting um, books up, um, about diversity and, and the, the um, story of indigenous um, families um, and lives and kids and all that kind of thing. And I think it's really important because we often struggle um, to 
to encourage families to buy books that come from a different perspective. I think a lot of people look at these books and they go, oh, that's lovely, that's great that um, Indigenous families um, can see themselves and those books are for Indigenous families or those books are for non-Anglo families. What I try to say to families is it's just in, important for non-Indigenous um, um, families to have these books in, in our libraries at home that our kids are seeing these stories. Um, I think for me, books are a mirror, so we do need to see ourselves in um, children's picture books, particularly, um, but um, it's also a window. So our kids need to see what these um, other lives are like, and that um, teaches empathy and encourages kids to walk in the shoes of other children. So this one is just beautiful. I'll just show you a couple of pages, and it's simply family. The images are extraordinary. Each one you can really get lost in, looking at everything, just not from the story it tells, but also um, the technique. And it's family, heart and home. Yarning old people, endless sky, breeze through silky oak. Family, stories and songs. Sharing how to care for mob and country. Listening to aunties, uncles, elders and ancestors. Learning how to be to each other, to country. And it does go on further, but I'll leave it there. Just, um, it's just beautiful. So she has, they've done family and they've also done um, respect as well. So that's where I'll end um, my chat there. I just think it's really important that we're seeing books from those different perspectives where it's uh, it's a mirror, but it's also a window into um, another world. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was just wonderful. Uh, thank you to Emma Kate for um, doing the facilitation. I don't know whether there are any, any questions, EK? We haven't had any questions come through, no. So if any of you have any final comments um, that you'd like to make before I open up the Zoom room for everybody, then um, I'll hand back to you, but otherwise I'll open it up. And also happy to get recommendations of, of books that people have read this year um, as well. They can kind of send us recommendations because I know there's some really great readers out there. Yeah, send them through to books at avidreader.com.au if you have any as well. Um, lovely. So I think I'll take everybody off mute now if we're all ready to conclude. So thanks again for joining. And um, I've been posting all the um, information that you need in the chat box. Um, don't forget about the code event that you can use online um, and also in store, just mention it to your bookseller at the time. So I'm gonna take you all off mute now so you can join me in thanking Jennifer, Fiona and Sarah. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Have a lovely rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.